phone, extra got phones everywhere, and coins everywhere. Yeah, the, the cool thing about the collecting the ancient coins is that you're getting that historical context that you feel like you're missing with modern digital world where you see a picture on the screen or a line drawing, it's not the same. So, how long have you been teaching for? 15 years. Oh, amazing. What, what drew you to the religion teacher? Uh, well, um, probably because I was in seminary as okay. a Catholic priest and I discerned that that wasn't my vocation. But now teaching is sort of like what I could do as a lay person dedicated to good deeds. Oh, that's fantastic. So, for instance, I have um, the Pagetto's name. I don't know if maybe yeah, you're yeah. that, but I have the replica of that that I passed along. And yeah. some coins from, um, like, the Bar Kochka. Yeah, the that's Hawaiian. interesting, too, yeah. Um, I might have some. You yeah, have a Jewish too. war coin. Those are interesting, too. And But you're right. I totally agree about having that as a tactile example of history in those hands. Yeah, a lot. Because they're used to looking at pictures all day. Yeah, yeah and it's like... I, well, what is your number one way that you keep people from falling asleep? Interaction. Oh, interaction. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Asking questions, listening. Okay. Okay. Wake up. Do this. Wake up. Wake up. Talk. What about you? Are you local? Now, yeah. Okay. Welcome to. Yeah. I actually like the town. Uh, we rented a whole house on Airbnb, three story. Nice. So my friend got the second floor, I got the third floor, <laughs> each one with its own bathroom, like that's fantastically stocked with anything you could ever need. It's fantastic, you know. I feel right at home here. So I'm not even looking at the time. About one ten. So we'll give it another like five, ten minutes and make sure I don't have any Dennis Menace hair going on here and otherwise I should be fine. You know? <laughs> Questions? Sure, sure. I'd love What's to. What's your background? So I'm a, I'm a world renowned because people around the world know me for all the articles I've done. You know, I've made probably over 40 to 50 videos on YouTube explaining each coins. Worked with over 80,000 ancient coins and world coins put together. Um, I learned this stuff. I sell on eBay. So I like to set myself apart in my presentation because. What I feel like everybody else is doing is selling a, just a coin, but it's the history that's more important to it because without that historical context, you, you're not getting it. So what I try to do is educate others, be enthusiastic, enthusiastic about it myself, and other people get enthusiastic too. And yeah, that's my background working. I have 19,000 items up on eBay. I have 100% positive feedback. I practice the golden rule working with my customers because that's the only way to do it, you know. It pays to be honest and being good to people. So that's that's my motto. And yeah, I'm a, one of those guys in the trenches that actually deals with the physical coins. A lot of people read a book about it, show you a picture that they copied from a book, but what you're gonna be seeing through this presentation is actual photos of the coins that I have in, in my eBay store or had in my eBay store because they sell out sometimes, like the tribute penny coin, I can't keep it in stock, it just flies. Um, the other types, sometimes stay, sometimes they don't. But. So that's my background, being physically in the trenches with physical coins, learning about them, collecting them, investing into them, selling them to other people, and uh, having a good track record. That's. I hope I didn't ruin half your presentation. No, you, you didn't, you didn't. Oh, like, I mean, we have, oh, we have time for this way. Uh-oh, I was just trying to learn a little bit about where you're... Yeah, where you're well, thank you for asking. Talking. That's actually a good way for me to <laughs> kind of like introduce myself a little bit. Oh, no. Here yeah. we go. I ruined your presentation now. No, you didn't. Actually, you made it better. I appreciate the questions. Does anybody I, else have any other questions? I, I, I saw him do a presentation yesterday. You, you can't ruin his okay. presentation. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yesterday I did a presentation about eBay selling. Uh, the site is uh, trustedcoins.com slash selling guide. And uh, what I talked about it was like the main points that anybody could do to get started right now. To, you know, put their coins uh, online, you know, photographing them correctly, displaying them correctly for the internet for people to be able to buy it. Because there's a lot of people, there's a few simple things that people could do that anybody could do. And uh, sell pretty well online too.
I always welcome other people selling too, because that just expands the collecting community. Why not, you know? So, bring new, bring new people on board. I think that's what this Harrisburg Coin Club is all about. That's my understanding of it, is they're trying to educate more people and get them into collecting numismatics. I feel like people don't collect too many things anymore. You know, we're walking around with our phones and we're forgetting to see the beauty. Like for example, with gaming, right? They keep getting the higher resolution games, right? When you're walking outside on a sunny day, <laughs> it's like, wow. Like you see that and people are like, oh, I, I spent thousands of dollars on these gaming systems, but it's not the same. It's not the same as, you know, the creation that you have outside for free. High res blue sky. Yeah, it's like <laughs> unlimited K. It's a, exactly. You know? <laughs> so that, that's much better. So seeing, being able to see that and I come originally from Russia, and uh, we've experienced a series of inflation, hyperinflations, where uh, money goes to zero, but actual physical tangible objects that are that, like television, cars, things like that, they maintain value. So sometimes people lose the point in regards to money, that's my understanding of it, is that they're collecting the money, hoarding the money for money's sake. But then when you really think about the parable of the talents, where you had the master leave for 10 years, one got two talents, another one got one, another one got a half, if I remember correctly, and the third guy buries it, but the other ones invested it in, uh, into their communities, into businesses, and they multiplied it, and then the third guy gets it taken away because he just buried it underneath the ground where it wasn't being used for people. So it's just, that's what it is. Money is just a tool, it's a piece of energy. And the way it is now with the fiat currency, it's more of like inches. You can't run out of inches. So it's, it, it makes it in a way good, but it's all in your perspective of it, not just like, oh, all our money should be backed by gold and silver. It may be eventually, but it might not. But you could still buy gold and silver, which is fine too, and collect the numismatic coins that are connected to the history that are so limited in numbers, especially coins in the higher grades they become like single examples of them. Just even with American coins, you have coins in the MS67 grade. Some of them you can't spend thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars for that grade, for the little tiny point on a little plastic slab. But it, there's just so, so many limited of them. So that's why numismatics, I think it's also cool, so. Did you, uh, you mentioned about like, you know, quote unquote, trenches, yeah. you know, hands-on kind of stuff. Do, do you actually go to any of the sites where these coins are from? Like, you know, at the, or, or you ever have to source of these coins, so to speak? Uh, no, I don't undig them. I don't bring okay. them back. To, I go to <laughs> coin shows, I go to coin dealers, and I go to coin auctions. I participate okay. in the coin auctions, and what I like to do at the coin auction is, I go there, I see that say they have 300 lots, I go look through them, I pick out, let's say, maybe 10, 20 coins that are, are I think if I bid in the correct amount, I, if I can get them for under market value, then when somebody buys them for me, even with me making a profit, everybody wins. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm kind of like a scout. That's, yeah. when you work for yourself, you replace one boss with everybody being your boss because, you know, they don't have to buy from you, you know, so, so it's a little bit of a different perspective, so. Yeah, sure, sure. I'm just going to ask some questions until you're ready. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you're probably the most knowledgeable person I ever met. What got you started? And also, what do you, you obviously have a lot of passion for coins. What do you think the most interesting coins you came across? Ooh, what got me started? Okay. So many years ago, uh, the stepfather of my friend, who was a college professor of mathematics in New York at the time, he needed help listing coins on eBay. He was selling ancient coins. And I kind of became an apprentice to a mentor that started showing me, I started working with him listing the things because I knew the internet stuff, like how to photograph it, how to list it, present it really nice. And my friend really didn't like working like PlayStation better. So we became really good friends. I saw the potential, I saw the vision. I started listing up some stuff myself and eventually over years and over a decade now, I've been doing it since I was a teenager. I built up a knowledge base and I've built up a, 
expertise that, you know, to, that is probably one of the best in the industry. And what was the second question? Please remind me. Well, if, if you're employing an income process, you probably came across a lot of thousands. Okay. Of them, but you might have a handful that are like, oh yeah, this one is. Okay, so there was a coin that I recently won on auction. Um, that is a Jewish War Year 4 coin. There's less than 50 pieces on them. And there are more of the year two and three. The Jewish people is when they revolted against Rome. Rome started taxing people. Nero needed to build a nice big palace. So what you do is you debase the currency and you start taxing people more. Eventually people start getting fed up, they revolt. And year four was the last year that the revolt continued. And that shekel was a representation of people coming there. You have a civil war in Jerusalem, things are burning, you're getting besieged, there's hunger, there's strife and stuff like this. And people out of their devotion, they're giving their last silver into the temple to be restruck as like, you know, their tribute, you know, for the temple as believing people. And there's probably like 50 in existence. So that's probably one of the most interesting ones I got recently. But I've had other coins that are really interesting. Historically speaking, the actual Ides of March um, Julius Caesar coin, the portrait coin that was struck for about a month before he got murdered. You know, that coin that Cassius and Brutus, they're sitting there, they're like, okay, we have everything. Brutus, you're of that familial descent that kicked, kicked out the last King Tarquin for being a tyrant, and we, we've had a republic since, and now we need to save us again. We have to do it. So the, that coin, so that's his lifetime portrait coin, and I've had that. And that is actually the coin that I got invited to Porn Stars with. On the YouTube, you can see, uh, type in G, um, sorry, uh, Julius Caesar coin Porn Stars, and you could see the clip with me, you know. And it was pretty cool to show it. Go ahead. Does that have that has a purple of Brutus or Caesar? Is that a no, the, the coin has uh, Caesar in it. Caesar on it, but it was printed by the, the, the Senate? It, it was under the Roman Republic, yes. After the assassination, sort of as, as a glory of the day. No, the before the assassination. Okay, but do you oh, call it, we call it an Eyes of March coin. But yeah, the Eyes of March was struck under Brutus. So the Eyes of March coin is interesting. So you're not so, a living person is not supposed to be portrayed in a coin. Yeah, I'm Brutus. Brutus is an honorable man. You know, he killed a tyrant. You know, there's the famous Mark Anthony speech. And the Eyes of March is a very rare coin in decent condition. It could be a couple hundred thousand dollars and up. Uh, so what it features is actually daggers that they stabbed Caesar's with, Caesar with, and in the middle of the Cap of Liberty. And it says I the Marne for the Eyes of March. They did commemorate it, and it did have Brutus's portrait on it. So there's only a few examples of that. That's probably one of the most sought after coins. Uh, yes, that's the Eyes of March of Denarius. And that's ironic because that's one of the reasons why the assassin yeah, exactly. that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, now, now let's print one with that. So. The, the coin you mentioned about year four of the war, is that the 70 AD war or 135? Uh, that's the first Jewish Roman war. They so from 66 to 70 AD, okay. I think in 71 AD, the fortress of Masada that King Herod built, that's why he was called the Great, because he did a lot of building projects. He built a new capital called Caesarea, you know, Caesar's after Caesar, you know, but the after Caesar, they use that name as a title, a royal title, let's say, of the emperor that he was Caesar, Caesar Augustus, and then later it was Caesar Augustus, and then Pontifex Maximus, and then you have like letters, and then you have to like decipher the Latin, but if you want to, but otherwise it's a very long title. But yeah, the, the year four coin is very interesting. It has a chalice. The Actually, the Masons use that chalice on their uh, tokens. There's also Masonic tokens out there from the 1800s. You can see the little chalice, it has the little rim. So they do have a lot of Hebrew lettering in them, so there's interesting connection there. I don't know enough about it to talk about it, but I have some of the tokens, that's why I'm talking about it. But yeah, the year four coin is interesting, the year two, year three, but the bronze coins of that time period are very affordable. So that's the interesting thing. So, so really nice condition, maybe a couple hundred bucks, maybe even under 500. Yeah, really nice ones, but then, the cheaper ones could get even cheaper. And the, the final year you said it was silver, this sort of... This, this coin was silver. Okay. Yeah, this is like, 
less than 50 examples probably that exist. So that's the coolest coin. So perhaps we get started. We have everybody here. Welcome, welcome. Come on, come on. And okay. So I guess we have enough coins for everybody. So uh, let me just get away from someone. Since nobody else is coming, and we don't need to give away tickets, right? So <laughs> perfect. Uh, since you guys are a family, might as well just pick out which one one each and then pass them around. Yeah, these are authentic coins. Um, I think it, it, those authentic ones are the ones that I want to promote the more interesting to us. You guys just pick one each and then pass it around and then we have enough for everybody. Some of these coins actually I'm going to be talking about in the presentation, so it's going to be more interesting to you too. So. Okay, so where are you pulling this open? There it is. Any other questions before I get started? So this way we could just try to pass around anything that... Do you have a collection that you call your own or do you just deal in coins and know a lot about these That's a good question. Uh, I like that question in regards to I know a lot of dealers I've talked to have said, oh, I am a dealer and I do not collect these coins. You know, you so, seem more interested, is why I ask. <laughs> so the way that I see it is that I approach the field of numismatics uh, as a collector. So as I mentioned yesterday, it's actually, if you can see through John Jones' eyes, you could sell John Jones what John Jones buys. Mm -hmm. You can't help others without helping yourself. That's Zig Ziglar. You can't help enough other people. That's more than helpful. So I'm a collector until I sell the coin. I was just going to say, maybe I can even help you out with the answer. They're all your collection until yeah. you sell them. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Okay. So if I have a bunch of nice coins, I'm more than happy to do it. And somebody wants to pay me a reasonable price for it where I feel it's worth, you know, how much is something really worth is when, uh, like a meeting of the minds. Yeah. Like for somebody, a uh, BMW or a Mercedes is not worth it, but they like a nice $25,000 brand new car, which is fantastic too. So, you know? Okay. So yeah, just, just pass it on. So I'll just get started and you guys just keep passing around the things and make sure everybody gets a coin and uh, happy you guys are here. So this talk is entitled Historical Coins. You guys could read the screen yourself. All right, name is Ilya Zlobin. I'm an enthusiast, expert and dealer in ancient and world coins. I've worked with over 80,000 coins. I have an eBay store with 19,000 items, 100% positive feedback. I like to treat my customers right, and uh, what I do is I make tons of videos and articles in regards to the different coin types where people can get educated, and that's the kind of customers I want, that people that are educated about the coins and we want to come back to me for a lifetime. I'm not looking just for the one sale, so that's why I make videos. I have a lot of videos in regards to all these different coins already online. So. There are some really great reasons to collect the ancient coins. I came up with a bunch of them. There's, of course, the connection to the past that you feel only by holding that ancient coin. You think about the person that held it. You know, did they buy bread with it? Did they go off to war and never come back for their treasure trove? What happened to it? What happened in it? What was the political situation of the time? What does it say in the Bible about it? Since it's a Christian talk. What does it say about that time period in the Bible about it? Or let's say if you're, if you're of the Jewish faith, what happened in the Jewish community at the time? What, what was happening in Jerusalem? So there's a million and one reasons to collect. We, it, to each one of us, it's a personal reason. But it's an amazing thing to behold, authentic ancient coins, and I completely promote that. I love it myself, and I'd like to share that with you guys right now. So first we're gonna start talking about ancient Jerusalem coins. And uh, basically with the Jewish kings. So the biblical widow's might. The widow is poor, she only has a couple lower denomination coins. 
in her pocket. Maybe enough to buy a couple slices of bread, a part of bread, enough money to like maybe feed herself for the day. And she throws that on the collection plate. And like these guys that are throwing in gold coins, silver coins, they're like, huh, look at her like, you know, donation. But it was Jesus that kind of interrupts it. I'm giving you my contextualization of it, of course. I'm not giving you the exact quote. But he's like, she's giving her all. And you guys are throwing in like a little gold coin, a little silver coin, and that's like one millionth of your treasure trove. So it just shows about like no matter how much you have, you could always give your best, or always, you know, dedicate it. So there were several different coin types. In the Bible, you don't know which coin she gave into the collection plate. What we do know is that it was the lower denomination coins that were circulating in the area and that were used in everyday commerce. They were little bronze, you could say copper, but bronze coins where it could have been of the Jewish king's types. So this is really interesting. We have the uh, Alexander Janaeus. So in it, he actually has the Greek letter, lettering for his king's name. And you have also Hebrew on this side, I believe. Paleo Hebrew. So these coins are interesting to both. To both. You have to understand that Christianity and Judaism, it started out in the same place. And that's why it's important to actually collect these for everybody that's part of, you know, Judeo Christian heritage, let's say. So here's another type which is kind of cool, John Hyrcanus, who was another uh, biblical king. And now I'm gonna talk about the coins. So in the Bible, it talks about the, the Magi coming in from the east. So on this coin is of the kingdom of Northern India, which was called the Scythian kingdom. And this coin could have been the pocket in the, in the pocket of the magi that visited because they're coming from the east east bringing frankincense myrrh and other things that is in the account so this is kind of interesting just to collect that from the far east that the coinage was struck from around the time period and that's one of the types this type over here we have actually an ancient greek coin with the star you see this little star over here and you have the ram over here. So it is believed, according to the research article that's linked in the article that I have to this, that it actually commemorates the star of Bethlehem as an actual event on a coin, and then they did it for maybe 100 years commemorating that event. So that connection to the history on a Greek coin is really interesting all in its own. Now, we're, let's talk about the coins of King Herod. One, sorry? I think by non-Christians. I think it was like a celestial event. Okay. It's interesting, on several coins, there's actually a coin of Julius Caesar. No, no, sorry, there was the comet of Julius Caesar on his death that was actually commemorated on a coin of Augustus, the adopted son of Julius Caesar. So there was, I guess, celestial events that were commemorated in coins. Okay, so not Christian emphasis. Yeah, the, the Christians, they're, at this time period, they're, there's only like Jewish people there. So there's no such thing as a Christian because Jesus didn't have time to, you know, preach and make miracles happen. So it's still interesting, the celestial event, so you could read up more on it. I have a whole article linking everything together, but we'll get to that in the end. So now, King Herod, why was he called the Great? He, some people could argue he wasn't so great because he wasn't too nice of a guy all sometimes, but he did do great building projects. One of the greatest building projects is that he created this outer wall to the Jewish temple, to the great temple that wound up getting destroyed later. And he was apparently the king of Jesus' birth, and there was the census and a whole other things happening, so we want to look at his coin. So it is believed that this coin, with the anchor, that it's in honor of Caesarea Maritima, Maritime Caesarea, which he also built, like a, like a port city, capital, 
and the anchor being a naval power. The Greeks often put the anchor on their, showing their naval supremacy, or like ships, things like that. So this is kind of interesting. You have the anchor, you have also the cornucopia. The cornucopia is a symbol of abundance and plenty, and it's kind of cool to put that on the coins. One of the things you're gonna notice with the coins, especially with the Romans, I, yes, they were pantheists, or like they, they, they worshiped many gods and goddesses, but what I think they also worshiped was also virtues, manliness, uh, you know, piety, things like that. You, you would see a coin with pietas on it. So it's like, how do you worship a word? So you kind of have to manifest it and think, but that's a whole different story going into a different tangent. So King Herod coin, he had several different types. I'm gonna share the book where you could just get this one reference book which has all the types and you could read a lot more about them by David Hendon. He's the main reference book for these types. But we'll get to that later. Next, let's talk about this coin is probably one of the central coins that could be described. So we have, it's the coin that was accepted as a donation in a Jewish temple. Every Jewish man was supposed to donate half a shekel coin at the temple as, you know, as a temple tax. It was called the temple tax for the great temple. So this coin was used. This coin was used specifically, it is believed that because of the silver content, because of the silver purity, 90% plus pure silver, consistent weight, so this mint of Tyre, so that's why it's called the shekel of Tyre. But it's not just mentioned in one place in, in the biblical accounts. It's also the same coin that we're talking about as St. Peter's fish. So they ask him, oh, are you gonna donate? So he goes to St. Peter, go catch a fish. There's gonna be a coin, and there's gonna be a half shekel for me, half shekel for you, and then you have a full shekel, which would be, you know, two half shekels together. The, the half shekel coin, by the way, is a lot more rare than the full shekel coin. Leading me to an understanding is that usually people didn't go to the temple alone. Probably they went there with their son, their father, things like that. So that's kind of interesting. So it's the St. Peter's fish account coin. And it's also the coin that was being exchanged because people were exchanging their foreign currencies of other lands, other nations, for that type of coin that was accepted as a donation because of the purity of the silver and things like that. But there wasn't just that happening. There was the money changers, of course. You know, Jesus cleanses the money changers. But it wasn't just that. The whole temple grounds was turned into a flea market. He kind of like kicked every, he's kicked everybody out. Like stop selling goats and pigs and sheep. Like what is this? This is God's temple. So that's, a, that's one of the coins that he, as he's overturning the tables, flew everywhere and got a lot of people pissed. When you do that, you know, people don't like you too much. And then on top of that, it's a contender for the type of silver coin that was given to Judas to betray him. And in the account, it's like, what is going to cost you? 30 pieces of silver. So they're not telling you the specific coin that was given. So you have to look at the kinds of coins that was there. So it's possible that this other type of coin with the Roman emperor instead was given to him. I'm just thinking logically, right? So you have this coin that's important for the temple tax. It's a holy coin. Why are you going to give it to this guy to betray him? Why don't you just give him this other coin that you had the money changes exchange for them? Like, and so it's either that or that. So you have to look at it in the context of that because the Bible is not telling you the denomination, the weight, things like that. You have to look at the coins at that time and make up your own conclusion. And always re go back into the history and look at the actual account. What does it say? And, and then make up your own decision interpretation on that. So then we move on to the tribute penny. They try to fool Jesus, you know, with a, co with a coin, should we be paying, you know, taxes to Caesar? He's like, whose name is on the coin? They say Caesar, okay. So render to Caesar all that is Caesar and render to God all that, all that is God's. So if you're gonna use Caesar's money, Kind of has his name on it, kind of maybe probably pay tax, but it was just kind of like a really good way to get out of that because it's a good way not to get crucified just yet, just 
you know, probably a good idea. So why these two types specifically? So Tiberius was reigning during the time of the, you know, the crucifixion and his Jesus preaching what he did, creating miracles. But the interesting thing is that the hoard evidence suggests that the Augustus coin of a little bit earlier time period was more abundant than things. So when you have first century coins coming up, you have this one a lot more abundant than this one. So these two could be the two contenders as a tribute penny because it's a tribute penny. That's the only interpretation you really could do. The most common coin, most likely. So you have the Augustus with the, with the heirs of Augustus and you have Tiberius with his mother Livia. Somehow people magically died around her, like the, the heirs of Augustus never got around to be heirs. It was Livia's son that became the emperor later. But the interesting thing though is that he also had a villa where, I don't know if you guys ever heard of the infamous emperor, the crazy one that made a horse to the Caligula. He was there as a kid in this guy's villa on Capri and there was some really bad debauchery going on, people being thrown off cliffs that where he probably learned a few things about being a little nuts. So, so the two tribute penny types, some people like the Tiberius one, which is kind of cool, and the Augustus one is kind of cool too because it's during the birth and uh, you know, at least the early childhood of Jesus walking around and kept circulating around. Next, <clears throat> Judea, Jerusalem area was under the control of the Romans since probably like 40s BC, you're gonna have to do further research on that. But it was under Roman procurators. That's what Pontius Pilate was. He was a Roman administrator in Jerusalem. So that's before whom Jesus was brought for a trial and crucifixion. And there was a whole lot of uh, political things going on and eventually Jesus gets crucified. So the two most interesting types probably to collect, this one's a little bit earlier. So yeah, you have a 29 to 30 AD. Some people might think this one is the more likely candidate that's during the lifetime, like being circulated, because he might have been. So if he was born around like six BC and then crucified, he might have. This one might be the closer one, but still, this one was also struck 30, 31. So, what's interesting about it is that you have pagan symbolism on it, circulating in a Jewish area and community. So it's so it's kind of like a little bit of a poking here going on back and forth. And you have these sheep wreaths. This is probably a symbol of abundance of the land, of the growth of uh, wheat and barley, things like that. And on this one is a blatant symbolism of the Pontifex Maximus. This it's called an augur's wand. So in a Roman religion, this symbol was used. But think about it in the context over there. So yeah, and you have the L I Z date. How often you? date coins is actually dated on the coin. So for Greek coins, it would be the city era. So it's the 100th year of the founding of the city, let's say, or since this king's birth or death or whatever. So this L-I-Z stands for the year of his reign. So this one says year 17 of Tiberius reign, and that's how we know it's from uh, 30 to 31 AD. So that's one of the things about the dating. So these are the two types of the uh, Pontius Pilate coins that are interesting to collect and own and cherish and love and treasure. Not all coins are really nice like this. I show, I'm showing you real examples that I have or have had in the past that might have sold me. So now let's talk about Nero. Nero what is important is obviously important to history in itself because eventually his raising of the taxes wound up getting a revolt happening, but in a war in Jerusalem and the Jewish people's fighting for their freedom. And it culminated in a sacking of the temple and going from there. But here's a silver denarius coin of Roman Emperor Nero. The standard coinage of the, was the denarius of the, at least the Roman Empire, uh, other than the Greek provinces. Was a denarius coin? It was probably around the size of a dime, and uh, it had different various gods and goddesses. And here's uh, Nero, an authentic coin of him. Oh, he, of course, he persecuted Christians and blamed them for a fire that he might have started, 
because he needed room to build a really big palace, and then he also raised taxes to build a palace and debased currency. So, yeah, important to collect. Now, let's talk about St. Paul. So, St. Paul was actually Saul of Tarsus. He used to persecute Christians, then he has a vision, he sees Jesus, and then he changes his name to Paul and starts preaching Christianity. He travels all over the ancient Greek and Roman world to a bunch of these towns. So I wrote like which acts he's traveling to. So he travels to Cyprus, he travels to Rome, he travels all over the place. So that's a coinage series all on its own to get, let's say, a Greek coin or a Roman coin from all these different areas. So this picture in the background over here, this is the library of Ephesus. So on his travels, one of his many travels, he comes to a place of Ephesus where there was a large merchant class that was building little figurines which people could take home and worship of the pagan gods and goddesses. He's like, there's only one God, we shouldn't be worshiping idols. Gets run out of town. So the, some of the ruins there, it's now in Izmir, Turkey. You could actually visit, I visited it, it's really beautiful. There's even a theater, an amphitheater, an outdoor Odeon, I believe, where uh, 50,000 people could sit. It's still visible. It used to be kind of like a coastal city and then kind of got entrenched and a lot of it is preserved. Really cool sight to see. So this is an ancient silver coin, Greek silver coin, during like the Roman control, I guess, of the time uh, with the Dionysic, um, Dionysus was the god of wine. So you have the, you have the serpent, uh, you have serpents everywhere, you have a little owl, very pagan, but very interesting to collect all on its own because it's an ancient Greek coin from the town that St. Paul visited. That's why it's part of the St. Paul's visit. I could be showing you a lot more coins, but I'm trying to keep the flow going here. This coin is really interesting because we have Nero's name, Nero, in Greek. And you have uh, this, this name for Caesar. So this is a coin of Jerusalem. As he's traveling, he's preaching, gets arrested. Paul goes, I'm a Roman citizen. I demand my right to be tried in Rome. So he goes, travels to Rome and has that trial there, but it was under this one that we had, you know, the Porcius Festus, I believe. Right here, Biblical Jerusalem, Porcius Festus. And he arrived there, and this is pretty cool. You have Nero, and you have the Porcius Festus, you have the connection of the two, and he travels to Rome, and might have gotten the denarius coin that we saw previously. In his pocket, he might have bought some food with it. So now, tired of being taxed, tired of wanting their own country, they revolt in Jerusalem against that. And now we have coinage that's exclusively Jewish, which is really interesting to also behold. So on one end you have the freedom of Zion, and on the other side you have the year that the coin was minted. We have a year two over here, and the year four obviously is towards the end of the culmination. Coinage numbers go down, they're kind of like losing, but in the end if you really think about it, that revolutionary spirit to be free peoples might have influenced you know, our founding fathers to be, you know what, I'm John Hancock, I'm gonna, I want the king to be able to read my name without his glasses on, because these people put their for lives and fortunes, and most, a lot of them died, a lot of them like lost their properties, but they wanted freedom, and it was at any cost. You know, Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. That's, that's really a revolutionary idea, so it's really important. They still won by having influenced us in the future generations to have adopted some of the beliefs in Syria. So the ancient Jewish coins are really interesting. There's another Jewish war that happened later. It was called the Bar Kokhba revolt that was started by Simon Bar Kokhba and that's when actually Jerusalem got leveled and renamed to a different town called Aelia Capitolina. I believe under the time of Emperor Hadrian. And coins of that area is also interesting to collect. I don't have any in this presentation because that's taking off track, but it's important to know that historical context and understand it and study it further. That's why I recommend having the books on hand and getting that context, reading it and looking at the stuff yourself. So the Jewish war, it culminates with Titus 
Vespasian, his father, goes back to Rome to be emperor. And Titus, his eldest son, I believe the eldest son, gets left to finish off the revolt in Jerusalem. They stormed, the, I think for a long time, they stormed them, there's starvation, there's civil war inside. They go in there, they sack the temple, destroy the walls. They couldn't, they just couldn't get the last wall down. And that's called the Wailing Wall to this day. That's a place of prayer, a, a holy place that Jewish people come and pay their homage. And uh, they put notes in between the crevices of the stones. So this imagery comes from the Arch of Titus. What's interesting about the Arch of Titus, it stands right outside of the Colosseum. The Colosseum got its name really from the colossal statue that Nero built of himself, the golden statue of Nero. But they renamed the two kind of like a sun god because he had the rays from the sun, like, you know, Colossus, Colosseum. But in reality, it's the Flavian Amphitheater because it was built under the Flavian emperors. And this arch shows the menorah from the great temple being brought back by the captured Jewish peoples to Rome. And all this money that they looted out of there later was built, was used to build the Colosseum, which further continued like what happened in the future generations, lions, you know, further persecution of maybe Christians, things like this. And the Romans issued a series of coinage called Judea Capta. On the back, you have a Jewish woman crying underneath a military trophy. What is a military trophy? You defeat the enemy and you take a stick and you put all the arms on it. And so she's sitting in there crying and it says Judea. So it was a series of commemorative coins. This is my nicest one. Really sharp, really beautiful. And there's only single numbers of such beautiful, sharply struck coins. Because what happens oftentimes is that the front might be still sharp, but the reverse doesn't get struck. But when you see the design, almost like the person's imagery on the face, that's when you have like a really exceptional piece that you could like treasure and cherish in of that historical time period. So that's very interesting, the Judea Captor series of coins too. Now, Christianity goes underground, probably not a good idea in a pagan world to be believing in one God and believe a, uh, Christian beliefs. So they came up with a symbol. You, you had the meetings and people would draw a little fish and you would have the letters in Greek, ichthyos. Uh, it has a more a meaning behind it, but it has a double meaning, fish and something else. Read further on, but this gold plaque is from that time period. And only those that really understood really know, knew what it meant. So it continued spreading. So we're talking about second century so from 100 to 300 AD, Christianity keeps spreading. You have people to preaching the message and it continues. And the last great persecution of Christians happened around uh, 312 AD. And these are tied to that Diocletianic persecution or the great persecution of Christians that, and this is a Roman coin of that time period with specifically pagan motifs. You have Tyche, which is, represents the city, and you have this river god, which re represents the river. And this, I believe, was from uh, Antioch. Antioch was one of the really major cities. And on the back, you have Apollo standing, holding the patera, and this one. The patera, I believe, was like a little plate with incense, and they would put that on a fire, and you know, the, a lot of Christians actually got persecuted, like, hey, all you gotta do is just take this, throw it in the fire, you're gonna be good. They're like, no. And then you have all the martyrs that happened from that time period. You had people that just said no. And horrible things happened to them, but they won because in the future, other people were free to practice their religion. And then you have St. Constantine. He sees a vision from God. He has a great battle to win against Mesentius at the Battle of Milvian Bridge around 312 AD. He paints the Cairo, which is the Jesus Christ monogram in Greek, the Christogram, and goes on to win a great battle. We have like 
a really important section. He's still a saint to this day. And now we have this coin. This is the symbol that was painted on it. And you have this coin commemorating. It is believed that this is the Milvian Bridge. Because why are you going to put a bridge on a coin of your reign for no reason? So there's a Milvian Bridge coin. And then eventually you have the Council of Nicaea, which standardizes Christianity for the whole world that we have it for the dates, the, especially the Eastern Orthodox faith, and it's called the Nicene Creed. You have to do further research in it, but this coin over here is from the town of Nicaea and Bithynia. So cool to collect because of that connection. Around 330 AD, Constantine sees the empire is so vast. He looks for a place to found a new capital. There was an ancient Greek town called Byzantion that gets renamed for his namesake, Constantinople. When the Turks took it over, it became Istanbul. So this coin commemorates this one. It says around it, Constantinopolis. So that is the imagery of the city goddess. Like for example, Athens had Athena. Uh, Rome had Roma. See, it says herbs of Roma. You have the personification of Roma. So each city had the personification city goddess. So you have the Constantinopolis, and on the back you have victory going on a ship going forward. He didn't want to leave Rome out and his found founders, Romulus and Remus, suckled by the she wolf, and you know, building original, original founders of Rome. So that's an interesting uh, series. And these actually could be bought very, very affordably. The coins of Constantine the Great Time, very affordable. One of the reasons being is the basement of currency. So if you're using less silver, you can make more. And inflation causes it, you're producing more. So maybe it was a good thing, if, at least in the context of we could look at. And then 337 AD, he dies. And this coin was issued with a specific, distinct imagery where the modest day, the hand of God, and Constantine in a chariot reaching for God upwards. So this is very interesting, and it's also pretty common. You could buy it very inexpensively in reasonable grades, and it harkens on to later imagery where man always strives for that. This is from the Sistine Chapel. And this is St. Helena. This is from the St. Peter's Basilica. There's a big, she's holding a cross. She's attributed to finding remnants of the true cross. And she's also a Christian saint, and her coins are also very affordable. So very important part in history, and very interesting. This is a rarer type because it has a little star in it. But yeah, there's plenty of other ones. Now let's move on to the Christian symbolism as it developed on Roman coins after Constantine the Great. Because he's attributed to officially Christianizing the Roman Empire. And from then on, you had Christian motifs on the Roman coins. No more pagan gods, no more sun god, no more Mars, no more Venus. You have Christianity in charge. The Cairo, this is the standard that was painted on the city for the great battle, the cross. And this is, a, this is another variation of Christian symbolism. It's called the Staurogram or the Tauro. This large coin obviously has the Cairo, and what's interesting, it has also the letters A and W, Alpha and Omega. That's from the Book of Revelations. Further you know, information should be looked into it. What's interesting about this coin, this is a much later coin than Constantine, but it shows the attribution around. If you read it, it says, In hoc signo victor eris. By this sign conquer. So you have victory, Crowning the emperor, that, that's one of the things like victory is being described, but later you could describe her as an angel because after the Christianization of the Roman Empire. And see what he's holding is the labarum. The labarum is the Cairo on a Roman military standard. So there's variations to search for. You might want to get a labarum or a Cairo, but it's pretty much the same thing. Now, this one is an illustration, this is a Byzantine era coin but from very like only 500 AD, so a little bit after the fall of Rome. And you have the Tauro, you see the, the Tauro, and you have a globe cross. 
and you have victory holding it. So this shows the transformation of the goddess Victory and her um, equivalent in, to the Greeks, which was Nike. Now she's transformed into angels we still see to this day on Christian iconography. So very interesting coin illustrating that. This is a later Roman coin of Theodosius with a cross, obvious symbolism there. Now we're talking about the Byzantine era. They issued a lot of different coin types with Jesus Christ in them. There's a beautiful gold piece on it. So one of the things that obviously to look at is that you have some of these Roman, the ruling rulers of Constantinople. And then this is the more important side, obviously. That's why it deserves the central attention. But there was a lot of different series. Jesus is portrayed in different ways. Sometimes he's sitting on a chair, sometimes he's standing up. A lot of different ways, and for a long time it was shown. But this series is very interesting too. These are large bronze coins, about 2.8 centimeters. I write all, the standard for coinage is millimeters. So 28 millimeters would be 2.8 centimeters. So you could look with the ruler, this is the size of the coin. So these are light, large bronze coins, they're anonymous. What you're gonna notice is that on the back you don't have any emperor. So they're called the anonymous class A through N folos coins. So about 100 or so years they were issued. And this one was kind of interesting is that it says in Greek, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. And then you have Jesus on the front holding the book of gospels. Very interesting. And the time period we're talking about 1020 to 1028 AD. And this coin over here is Crusaders. So Crusades was an important part in history. It, because of the Crusades, the Western world is the way it is today, you know? Thank you to them. This coin is of ancient Cyprus, and it's a later coin from circa 1358 AD. Features the cross. This is actually the cross of Jerusalem, by the way. This type of cross, and uh, it's kind of interesting. Very important to collect. And now you have uh, murals like this through the, throughout the Byzantine empires. Of gee, this is called Christ Pantocrator. Uh, it translates to something from Greek, but it's one of the most beautiful images of Christ that. He's always holding the gospel. And you see in Greek, it says, Is Chus, Jesus. So that's interesting. Now let's move on to three books. I highly recommend, I own these myself. I have them at my table. I've been showing them to people. This is the main reference book, David Hendon, Guide to Biblical Coins. So how do you use this coin? So you, let's say you have a Judean coin or the Jewish king's coin. You go, you go to the back, there's places, pictures of actual real coins. And you compare yours to that, and then it's numbered inside, and you can look through it. When uh, you get a coin from me, I reference this specific, the blue book. But these over here, these other books, the coins of the Bible and money of the Bible, they're just like beautiful picture graphic books with a lot of history written in there. But this is, the, this is the main one you could get. This is like secondary, but it's a cool presentation piece because a lot of color pictures in here. This is, this is why they're cool. And uh, this is the list of the books. It's available in the article. You just click the link, go on Amazon. You know, guys know what to do. So values, condition, and best prices. Okay. I'm not the only one selling these coins. So shop around. Look for your best interests. Make offers. Try to get beautiful coins because chances are, like, if somebody, if you love the coin, somebody else in the future might love it too. So that's why I try to buy the coin with the collector's eyes. I try to get as much of a good condition as possible, as much beauty, as much centering, where it's a happy medium where everybody wins. In my eBay store, for example, you can make offers. Don't be afraid to make even low ball offers because sometimes you win. Even Robert Kiyosaki does that. You know, he's a real estate investor. He just puts 50% offer on everything and then sometimes people sell it. So if they want to sell a property, they want to sell a property. They might have had it for a little while. So shop around. And if you ever want to get an ancient coin graded or certified, uh, send it to NGC coin. Like, so a lot of coins I actually have slabbed already. NGC, Numismatic Guarantee Corporation. They're pretty easy to ship to. They're in Florida. A lot of coin shows, you can actually bring it in and hand it in. They actually do ancient coins. A lot of the grading services, they don't have the expertise in order to do it. I like them. I use that for a lot of the coins that I have of like, let's say higher value. But, yeah, also shop around with reputable people. Look up the reputation. It's like, you can't really fool an honest man. Like if this guy is treating people right, people appreciate that and they keep coming back and 
you'll write rave reviews. So shop around. Oh, also, in regards to pricing, it's really determined by the free market. It's like you have the exceptional piece. You have one out of the 50 pieces of the uh, year four. You don't have, it's like you, you could keep it for a while for yourself and you don't have to sell it right away. So technically people could name it. So the happy medium is probably the best place to be at sometimes. So it's beautiful enough but without the price because the price goes up in a, like a hockey stick fa fashion for the really high grade coins, mint state, AU. But then the mi middle where it's a nice extra fine coin, beautiful style, design, centering, strike, everything like that, you could get for a reasonable price. Try not to get the lower grader coins because, or unless you, unless you just want to get, get the types. If you want to just want to get the types, you get the low grade, it's like, oh, this one. But I like the medium ones because they're reasonably affordable and they're not enough design that might be keep people interested because it's pretty. So you can buy my coins at trustedcoins.com. I provide a lifetime guarantee of authenticity, a certificate of authenticity. So you're welcome to send your coins into NGC, uh, whatever you want. I guarantee them the certificate provides a nice context of the coins. That's my, you know, shtick is to, you know, give the historical context. I believe that my coins are gonna be circulating for hundreds of years and they're gonna be passed on as heirlooms. Nobody's gonna sell them, they're gonna just love them and treasure them and that's important. Because we can actually save history for future generations by having these passed on and talking about them and talking about the history and giving the context. Because the easiest way to tell is to say, oh, that doesn't exist. Or like, it's like one of those things that happens, like, oh, the history doesn't exist because there's not enough of those historical context that people don't get from. And nowadays with a lot of information like going in a digital black hole in the internet, a lot of information is getting buried. So by having this in physical form, it's something you could talk about and treasure and love and collect. And you know, it's still gonna have some sort of value. You know, it's, it's not gonna get printed to infinity. You can't print ancient coins. So the article over here is trustedcoins.com slash Christianity. You can type it on your iPhone, iPad, whatever, the, whatever you have that's connected to the internet. And I have links to a lot of the stuff. You can see the pictures of the coins I have in the slide. You could also download the slides and look at them for yourself. And I highly recommend visiting my uh, list at trustedcoins.com. I send out emails regularly, like every, once every couple days, uh, with videos and articles about coins. I like to educate people and share that with the world. It, it's a win-win for everybody, so that's pretty cool. And I want to give thanks to the Harrisburg Coin Club and Kevin L. Tyler, who call, called me and invited me to be here to present, and I appreciate you guys being here. Maybe if you guys have any questions, I'd love to answer them. But otherwise, that's, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Sure. If anybody wants to ask a question, I'd love to. Labyrinth? Yeah. What labyrinth? Uh, that, that, that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, but if you, you could go on Wikipedia, type in Labarum, and it, sometimes sites forever always go back to the original source if you really need to, but that's what it's called. So I just, I don't ask why it's called that. Anybody else or any questions? Sure. Yes. Yes. Uh, mail card Hercules. Oh, Hercules. Okay. Yeah, mail card Hercules. Yeah, Melkart Hercules. So there is like a syncretic deity uh -huh. uh, called Melkart Hercules. That, that's what he's talked about in the reference books. Did you say Malakar, like Mail card. Uh, it's spelled M E L Q A R T. Oh. So it's like Melkart, and then it's described Melkart Hercules. Okay. So what the Greeks did is that they had syncretic, syncretic deities. So you know, in ancient Egypt, they took uh, Zeus and they added a horn to him. Uh, Zeus Amun, and that's why when uh, sometimes people find Alexander the Great coins, he's featured with the horns of Zeus Amun, so they, they think Alexander the Great is the devil mm -hmm. because of the horns. So there, there was a synchronism going on with the, with the Greeks, so that's probably what's happening. Um, if, if I understood you right, the Jewish people would go to the temple, and then they would pay that silver coin yes. as their tax for two people, Yes. Um, and then they would, or they would have that exchange for shekels to actually shop within that flea market, is that? Uh, I don't know if they exchanged them for shopping. I think this was strictly a tribute penny coin, but I think what happened was it just a, the 
the symbol of God turned into more of like a marketplace. So I think that's what happened. Well, I'm wondering, uh, how did they buy the coins? In the courtyard of the Gentiles, could they have used those pagan coins there, or are they exchanging money in order to I think they probably could, they could have probably used a goat. I think it's just like a flea market. You could just be like bargaining guy. No, I'm going to give you two Tiberius tribute penny coins, you know, or whatever other coins that he had in his pocket. So I, I think they were able to. They could give pagan money to actually. Not, to, not to the temple. Yeah. Not to the not temple. To they would need to exchange it. So that's happening in the courtyard of the Gentiles, and then yeah, further in where the people are giving the money and the widow's yeah. giving her money. That, the, the inside of the temple, I don't know enough about it, so I, I have to refer you to somebody that's more knowledgeable about that. I'm more knowledgeable about the coins, but it's a really good question, though, in regards to the courtyard of the Gentiles and what, what goes on further. I need to do further research on that. Anybody else? Any other questions? Okay, so. Did, did anybody yeah. get theirs before I gave them back to the Jews? Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. So, yeah, you're welcome. I guess you're welcome.